we have to take care of certain things, whether it's the behaviors, whether it's the habits and stuff that maybe we have certain things that we've done to lead us to where we are, and maybe the same things that our parents did to get them to where they are. If we don't start taking or making the changes now, our kids are going to end up with those same diagnoses, with those same behaviors, with those same things that may not be serving us. Many parents wish that they could change their family's less desirable genetics and reduce the chances of heart disease, diabetes, or even obesity. And the thing is that we don't think that we can, or can we? This episode is rich with suggestions and expert advice to make simple lifestyle changes to really make a difference in your family's life. So if you're wondering how you can help model healthy lifestyle habits and behaviors, how your sleep, nutrition, physical activity routines affect your kids' health, or even how to make doable gradual changes so that your health and your kids' health is better, then this episode is for you. Dr. Loom is a pediatrician and founder of Generational Wellbeing, which is an online innovative platform for health. Dr. Loom is also on a mission to help mothers raise healthy, vibrant children and break the cycle of generational health issues. Listen in. I I love what you're doing with the um, generational well-being. So it's an online program then? Is that how it works? (laughs) Yeah. So right now it's online. I started this after 2020 when I had downtime. And really, if you you notice, I was more so online on Facebook and on Instagram. And now I want to, what I'm working towards is having a group coaching program where we really talk to parents like, okay, if you're struggling with this, creating habits and stuff like that, because to me, I, I talk about habits all the time because it's essential. It's like the beginning of everything, whether it is discipline or behavior or anything is because there's some kind of offset somewhere or either with communication or if I'm having uh, a diagnosis of diabetes, what have you been doing for the past 20 years? It didn't just start today. True. And probably I'm guessing you run across people, a lot of parents that don't realize that these little habits are going to become really big things later. Exactly. Because it's just uh, my frustration. I think when I first started practicing was very like, oh, just check the blood test to see if they've now been diagnosed with diabetes per se, because it runs in my family. Because Mm -hmm. there's that idea that it has nothing to do with me or what I do is my genes. And I'll just keep doing what I've been doing until I get that diagnosis. And then we get medications and then we keep going. But medications don't fix the problem. Yeah, yeah. So they're just treating the symptoms and not realizing that they can actually prevent. Exactly. And then that same language that you're, you're having these conversations in front of the kids. So they're hearing it. And in their minds, they know that, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. I am going to get diagnosed with diabetes by the time I'm maybe 20 or 30 because it runs in my family. So guess what? That 20-year-old will come into my office and say, which I did have one the other day. Oh, I felt so. Oh, I was just scared because I had palpitations and I was told that I was going to end up with a, a heart problem because it runs with my family. So I just wanted to get it checked out. So it's like anything you go through life waiting for that to happen. And we all know that our lives go in the direction of how, what we think, what we expect, we end up getting what we expect out of life. And if we expect to be sick, guess what? <laughs> yeah, you can find a way for your body to do You'll it. You'll find a way. Your body it has a way. Your thoughts and your feelings and your everything, it goes in that way. Your body is always going to find a way to help you get to that point of your expectations. So you're expecting bad things to happen. Guess what? It's going to happen. And it's, I knew it was going to happen. How about we change it? It's interesting because I, do you refer to that as manifesting? I, I refer to that as manifesting, but I'm a Christian. Yeah. And I, I study the Bible a lot too. Mm-hmm. And I, I love meditation. I love especially the scripture and what it says about guard your hearts with all diligence and stuff. Or I, I like the one where it's this one that came to me the other day. But there's certain things that once it happens in life, you're like, oh gosh, I was really thinking that's where my imagination went. Mm-hmm. 
And before you know it, you're manifesting it. Yeah. So yes, <laughs> it starts yeah. from inside to outside. And I think that's where your frustration with the habits probably really shows up too, because you're like, okay, if you're thinking that, and then you're also doing these other things that you know you shouldn't do because of your genetics or your history that you're worried about, you're feeding right. it from both sides, right? From both sides. And you're modeling it for your kids. So I do a lot of talk about you as a parent is you're a leader and your kids are going to follow what you're saying and what you're doing. So mm -hmm. a lot of times I'll get a parent who's so anxious. Oh my gosh, this kid is so anxious. I'm not sure why they're so anxious. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, you're making me anxious right now. <laughs> <laughs> why is she anxious? <laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> oh. I don't know where they got it from. I'm looking at the phone like, I wonder where. <laughs> but I have, I have fun with it too. It's uh, really no judgment, but really more so awareness. Because a lot of times we're not aware of, of certain behaviors or certain patterns until you have kids. And it's that leaving it out. So I usually say your kids are your mirror. If you look at that kid, they're expressing those emotions that you may be holding in. So a lot of times, and I, I see that with my kid too, sometimes she is just all over the place. I'm like, why are you just focused already? But usually I my mind is like, oh my gosh, I have a lot to do. I didn't plan my week, I didn't do this. And the kid is just bouncing off. <laughs> then mirror it in so many ways. So there's certain things that, oh, is my, I want this kid to be better and stuff. I'm like, start with you. You can start back by really looking at yourself, looking at your kid. And once they exhibit a behavior, find look for that behavior in you and start by adjusting it. And don't follow. Once you start changing, you see them, oh, this is how it's supposed to be done. And then I'm going to do it. And I'm like, yay, we did it. All right, well, next can we change? <laughs> So do you feel like there's an age limit to that change? If you had a 20 year old, a 19 year old, and they came, yeah. do you think they're still capable of making the change through you? I think so. So it, it's, and it's different, right? It's very different at each age and it's different with each kid. Like my two kids are very different personalities. My six year old loves all the attention. She wants to hang out. She wants to play. She wants me time. My 19 year old is leave me alone. Don't talk to me. <laughs> I want to be by myself. I like peace and quiet and stuff. But it's just keeping that door open where I am here when you need me. And she knows I don't have to text her every time. I don't have to call her every day <laughs> and stuff. But um, it should be just like, how are you? Hey, are you good? It could be that simple. But then know that if they have a decision that they have to make, they can trust that you're there to give them some kind of alternatives or options without pushing my agenda on her. Because I had to learn that. So yes, if, if depending on your relationship with them, but the whole idea is nurture that trust. Once you've nurtured the trust when they're older, I have to trust the fact that I've taught you everything I have to give and I'll allow you to make the mistakes for your life, but I'm here. Whenever you yeah. need me, I'm here. If you want to make a decision, you want to talk, I'll just listen. But it's understanding the kid. And I think most people, what they want is knowing that they have that person to go to. They have that person that sometimes I just want to talk and just let it out. I'm, I'm just there to listen. I hear you. Yeah. So what are the worst habits that people allow the family to fall into that really lead to the most devastation later. So for instance, you know, is snacking while watching TV. Maybe that doesn't seem like that bad of a situation, but maybe doing it over time and getting into obesity might be an issue. What are some of those things that you see in your practice? There are a lot, but I want to say it's relationship. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I know I talk a lot about habits with snacking and lack of sleep and stuff, but it all starts ultimately with relationship, where if we do not have a good identity with ourselves, we don't impact those relational skills with our kids. If 
I'm not able to communicate how I feel. I may just get back home at night, just lay in front of the TV. I'm tired. I just snack throughout the day. Why am I doing that? Did I overexert myself? Am I exhausted? Am I just drained where I'm looking for something to fill in that void that can only be felt, uh, filled in with connection? So mm -hmm. I feel like it starts, it's, I know it's a different take, but it starts from that, like that relationship because we're built for connection, we're built for relationships. And once it's broken, we figure out, we try to find other ways to cope. And oftentimes we cope by just snacking or grabbing anything because the sugars are rewarding. It's that quick fix reward. And we just sit there or we just uh, run through Netflix series where it's just, it just takes me away, right? It's, I don't have to think about it, but I can sit there and just be distracted away from what is really going on with me. And then I have that quick fix and then I'm good until the next day. But the, the the core of it is usually the relationship part, which is why I I talk to parents a lot because that core relationship, whether it's a parent child relationship or even having that one person, regardless if your parent is not there or just that one person that you can just connect to. That's so good because I think so many problems we try to fix ourselves, but we don't even know that we're trying. It's just like this anxiety that builds up in your system, and so you're trying to quiet, whatever the anxiety is, not even paying attention to what's really at the root of what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And also because as it's, things are changing every day, life as it is right now for adults or for parents is very different than it was three years ago. Life as it, it was, as we were growing up, is very different where sometimes we want to get stuck. Oh, when we were growing up, we didn't have to do this. The kids were listening to their parents. These kids this day, they are just, however you want to say it. But we forget that the challenges that they're facing today are just different. They're, they're faced with a lot of distractions. They're faced, they're bombarded by information from everywhere. We had limits. We didn't have phones to distract us. We didn't have TV or any of that stuff. Our parents could install in us whatever they wanted to install in, <laughs> in us. And we took it as a gospel truth, right? It's like, this is it. This is how it works. But there was no nothing else to come in there and object that idea because they could like, oh, this is how we do things and that's how it goes. They just, yeah, that's how life is. But now they're able to challenge it because they're getting information from everywhere. And sometimes we take it as, they're challenging what we're saying, but we can either flip it and say, change of perspective, broadening perspective. Maybe we can try that. Maybe we can try that. And everything is not a failure. It's just progress, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, do you think sometimes that puts pressure on parents too, because their kids can find out all this information and the parents feel like maybe they are supposed to know all this stuff themselves without looking it all up. Yeah, th there is a lot of pressure too on the parents because now you can see perfection everywhere. Oh my gosh, I wish I my kids went to that school or looked like that or behaved like that. So it puts a lot of pressure to either strive for perfection or this perfect parenting and stuff. But I also want to say that your kid was uniquely created for you. You have what it takes for that kid. And that's why I say it's the mirror. Sometimes if they're showing you something, it's just to sit back and listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, why? Sometimes just, okay, why? What is this? Why are you showing me this? What can I learn from my kid? My kid puts me in place all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them in their own ways, right? <laughs> They're, that is your kid for a reason. And you are equipped to take care of that particular kid. It's just for you to become aware that you have what it takes to nurture and to love that kid the way they were uniquely created to be nurtured. That's awesome. And, and if you're already a perfectionist, that just is amplified by all of the stuff that you can see. And, um, yeah. and yeah. it feels like you should be perfect all the time, but I don't know any perfect parents. I, d I barely know people who consider themselves good parents in the sense that they're always making the right decisions. I think we make lots of bad ones. And every once in a while, we're like, yeah, 
I did good. Yeah. And, and somehow it changes because when they're babies, you celebrate everything like, oh, the smoke. Oh, you said your first word. Oh, you took your first step. And it's just like small things that you, you celebrated. And then we get to a point, don't do that. Don't touch that. Leave that one. <laughs> and it changes. But it's just like with all of those things, those are all ways of communicating where even if you get to that stage where it's a toddler who is just constantly having tantrums and stuff, it's like that's their way of communicating. They don't know the words to express and they will yell, they will scream, they will move. And that's another reason why I like the routines because then you have to start being like, okay, why are you screaming? Are you, is it, is this like a, a problem we have during a transition period? That's usually typically the time. Oh, is it that I changed your routine without really communicating that change and you're expecting one thing and I'm giving you another one. So sometimes it's just, okay, why are we doing that? And I'll give an example of my kid with daycare last two, three, four years ago now, where after daycare, whenever I picked her up from daycare, she was always hungry. So mm -hmm. for the first few times it's, oh, I'm hungry, mommy, I'm hungry. So it's like screaming all the way home. So I had to change it where I would take her, I'll take a snack for her, either grapes or fruits or something in there. So once, whenever I got there, here's your snack. And we had a quiet ride home. Now, one day I forgot. She did not find me funny. <laughs> but do I yell at her for screaming? I'm sorry, baby. Mommy forgot. That was my fault. Then that, that we're humans. We're all going to make mistakes. Mommy forgets sometimes. And it's okay. And stuff. So it's with every tantrum or with every adversity. It's once you're vulnerable and you tell them that I forgot and I'm sorry. It's okay to be sad when you feel or to cry when you feel sad and stuff. And they realize that mommy's not perfect. I don't have to be perfect. Mommy makes mistakes sometimes. It's okay to make mistakes. Now, what do you do after the mistakes? You clean it up, right? Or we figure out how to repair it. Or if I make a spill, I don't have to, I don't, I'd never tell her now, oh, go clean up after yourself. It's already a routine. It's okay. It's okay to spill. We're not going to yell fuss about it. Just look for that mop and start cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> it's what's expected. And so there, there are things where the, the kids, once you have that consistency, once that expectation is there, it's easier. And life goes everywhere where I don't expect when I say consistency, it doesn't mean that everything is the same every single day. It means that, say, yesterday, per se, my schedule is all over the place, by the way. I work some days, I may work Monday, Wednesday, the next day I may work Tuesday, Thursday and stuff. But if it's a day that I am not picking her up from school, I communicate with her early. Mommy has to work today, so grandma is going to pick you up from school. You're going to go to ASP today. So there's that expectation because you know that there is going to be a change in the routine, but I'm communicating it to you early. That way you have the right expectations. Now you go to school, you're on the pickup line and mommy is not there. Or you're telling me I have to go to ASB and I'm just wailing, screaming because I don't know. They need to know that they're secure, that mommy is always going to be there because you are their person. <laughs> That's so true. I think when you're talking about habits too, like it doesn't have to be exactly the same. That's for most people, I think. The majority of the parents I know, there's always something going on. And yeah, where the communication comes in is so key. If they don't know what's going on, of course they're going to, you would freak out if you didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Okay. So with habits, one thing that I thought about was, what if I'm a parent who is, the habits we have are just what they have to be for us to survive. But maybe these habits aren't things that are benefiting the family. What argument would you have with them as far as like why they would need to change the habits so that they're more positive or healthy for their kids? I'll ask about how is that habit serving you right now? Yeah. So if that's how you think it should be, how is that serving you? What reward are you getting from that habit? If you like the results you're getting, and then that's fine. But if you feel like if there is some slight chance that habit may be hurting rather than serving you if that habit may be causing more harm <laughs> to you it may be a time to see what are the options do i have available 
with my current schedule. Because again, that usually comes because we feel like we have to be the same person every season. But every season change changes where I may have a habit that may serve me in one season, but there may come a different season that requires something else of me. Um, so I have to be able to be aware of that and acknowledge that and change. That's awesome. Yeah, I love it. That's so simple and clear. Yeah. <laughs> if you weigh it out, then it would make sense to do the change versus right. somebody forcing you to do a change. Correct. Correct. Because it's just, oh, oh, my kid does not like drink water. They're not going to drink water. We don't drink, we don't drink water. They say juice is good. And and that's from this, again, advertising all the stuff that comes with the distractions and the information that you have to see through as a parent. It's overwhelming. If you go through the kids out, I don't know how many <laughs> kinds of, and every, everybody's labeling it healthy, right? So in your mind, you're like, but I'm giving my kid a hundred percent juice. It says it's a hundred percent and it's good for them. So you can maybe stuck in that mindset that this is what's good. And this is what's best for my kid right now. And I'm doing what's best for them. But then it's going back in there. How about reading the label and seeing what's there? They may, it may be a hundred percent, but they add, they have to add something in there to make it preserve, to preserve it for the shelf life, right? There's usually added sugar in there. Let's look at how the sugar is serving you. And um, even selling in where it's okay, if you start introducing water right now, maybe you're not going to have this problem when they're a teenager and then you're trying to get them to drink water, but they're used to this juice for their entire life. So it's just, there's so many things where we're doing and we're really convinced that we're doing the best until some someone really points it out to you like oh maybe this is not the best way or maybe there's an alternative maybe there are other options to do it and maybe the downturn effects of what we're doing right now may not really serve us down the line you you brought up sugar I have to ask you this <laughs> we have so many holidays that celebrate with sugar yes and I was told a long time ago and I think this is true you can redirect us if not yes. that the more sugar you have the more comfortable compromised your immune system becomes and it makes you more able to catch things or your kids your family are sicker throughout the year kind of thing is that true it, it is true it is true because sugar usually when you have a lot of sugar it goes to increase inflammation remember like when they said covid there's all this stuff about inflammation and stuff so once the inflammation if it's high that really suppresses your immune system that suppresses your fight so I usually say with the sugars, it's like you going in there and blocking, uh, how do I put it? It's like you suppressing your immune system and then you send your kids to school where they're exposed to a lot of germs. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to end up with colds. Oh, but they're going to end up with whatever is going around. My kid happens to catch it. I don't know why. What are they eating? <laughs> what's a typical breakfast, right? Especially breakfast. Yeah. And not only that with inflammation, too most kids the way their, their bodies respond to sugar is different from us so it gives you that that boost of energy and you will see kids the behavior they're just hyper um <laughs> i had a, a, a sweet patient one day i've seen this baby from i've seen this kid from birth all the way and i happened to have a visit with her it was a sick visit early morning visit and mom was running late gave her a bowl of cereal and that's all the kid ate and she got into the office and she could not sit still. I'm like, what happened? This is not her. What did she eat? Cereal. What was in the cereal? A lot of sugar. But the poor kid will jump on my body, jump on mom, jump on the table, jump off the table and stuff. But I know this kid. I know she's not hyperactive. But the only thing that changed in her schedule, she did dry breakfast because that was just quick and easy. Wow. Yeah, to be able to see that difference night and day, like that's, did that convince the mom that wasn't the best plan for her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, sugar will raise inflammation, increase your risk of, of getting infections because it suppresses the immune system, but also for kids, they're very sensitive to it and it can get them where they're super hyper because of all of that energy. Mm -hmm. I also thought of uh, my kids, we were talking earlier, my kids are older, but 
I remember trying to pack really healthy lunches Mm -hmm. and the lunches would come home and it looked like they were opened and picked at and then closed. And so they weren't starving. The kids weren't, they weren't saying, I'm so hungry. So finally I was, I asked, what is going on at school? Oh, so-and-so shared their chips with me. So-and-so gave me this, so gave me that. So they were like literally a la carting off of other people's lunches because they didn't want to eat what was in the lunch that I prepared for them. How do you handle stuff like that? I control what's in my house. I control what's within my control and then allow them to be regular kids and negotiating when they're in school. I'll give you this <laughs> give me that <laughs> and encourage it, right? Because there are, there's only it's so much you can do as a parent. So I usually tell parents also pick your battles. And that comes with the holidays too. That comes with the Halloween and Thanksgiving and all of that stuff. It's just, it's once a year, twice a year. Be a kid. That's absolutely fine. Now, do I buy candy during Halloween and hand it out? No, I don't. But I know she's going to get it from school. But it's gotten to the point where now she doesn't, she's not really a big, it's just the whole hype and the joy about sharing and exchanging and stuff. Half of it goes out to the trash at the end of the day. So I don't take that joy away. I don't take that experience away from them. But I control what I can control in the house. Yeah. Now that's great advice because otherwise I think it'd be a losing battle if you're constantly trying to so, yeah. negotiate with them. Yeah. <laughs> you're right, bartering and trading, that's good, right? <laughs> so I know it's because it's, it's not the thing you do one time. It's a thing that you do consistently over time that makes a difference. So if you were to have a piece of chocolate or a piece of cake once a month, absolutely fine. But if you're having a muffin and chocolate or cake every morning, that's different, right? I I know that when you come in my house, I, I don't have a lot of uh, chips or there's certain things that I really make sure I don't have because I know when, especially with my six-year-old, <laughs> I know that when she's out there, she gets it, right? And, and that eases the relationship with other people right that gives her the freedom to be able to say i can give i can receive from other people i can negotiate to get what i want i can ask for what i want so it goes through different levels where there's going to be a time where i'm not going to be here but i trust that you're able to make certain decisions what's best for you the other thing i try to teach them to try to get know your body and know how your body responds to the food you eat right because sometimes if you're we have my tummy hurts mommy that's because you ate a lot of candy today i think can eating too much candy may not be a good idea right yeah <laughs> so next time how about we eat only one or two instead of the whole package right so you're now putting that together okay if i eat this i may not feel good or my body really tells me or gives me information as to certain choices that I make especially about what I'm putting inside and it's probably more aware too if you're full or if you're just grazing like we were talking about at the beginning too if you're paying attention to how you feel after you eat right and that comes to the habits as far as eating let's say with eating habits I usually would start with Again, start with where you are. What, what do you want from this? Is this a problem where my kid is a picky eater? Half of the time they're drinking juice and milk throughout the day. And that fills them up. Where even if I presented a healthy meal to them, they'll look at them like, oh, I don't want it. Because guess what? I'm not hungry anyways. It's not going to take away from me, right? There's no incentive to try it. So it's just starting out with what's where is the calorie coming from and start reducing certain things. And once you start reducing and adding structure, it takes time. But I usually say one at a time and celebrate every week. Oh, you ate one carrot today. That is amazing. Tomorrow we might try a strawberry. And I don't expect that if, let's say, a pea, I'm introducing something like a pea, if that's the first time I'm introducing, I have very minimal expectations there because this is something foreign. I usually relate it to, let's say you went to a foreign country and they put some weird stuff on your plate. You're going to have exactly the same reaction. You're like, what is this? And someone is fussing you, you have to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and if we had the choice, we wouldn't. We would not touch okay, it. Like, it, you have to eat it and finish it. And you're looking at the person like, this is abuse. <laughs> <laughs> but we know it's our kids. Like, kids looking at it like, this is so foreign to me. 
I can't possibly put that in my mouth. And so I do not expect them to shove up a whole plate of peas, but just to look at it. It's not me putting it in your plate and saying, eat it, clean up your plate, but we're trying this together. Touch it. Tell me what you feel, what it feels like. Taste it. What do you smell and stuff? Do you think you like it? What kind of stuff do you like? Because you have to get to know the kid too. Everybody's different. Their taste preferences are different and stuff like that. But as you do that, you get to understand the preferences, the texture preferences. Do I like things sour or sweet or everybody's, you know, so... As you start doing that and you introduce is making them more like you start with anything, including the habits, it's uncomfortable. But until you start really doing it every day, I'm like, mm, I can do this. Oh, this tastes good. Oh, this gets better. Oh, this is easy. It's how we do things now. We eat peas. <laughs> well, I was just thinking that probably relates to activity and exercise too, right? You can start the same way. Yes, we, we, we start the same way. And I like activities with kids because play is it's really an important part of the development that it's not just, oh, they're playing, but play is really important. It brings out their creativity. It brings out who they are, what they are, and it gets them active too. So it's besides the activities, the creativity, if they're in a team, is like learning how to take turns. There's so many things that go into play, whether it's at school or with teams or even at home, that may be your time to bond with your kid. That may be your time to get to know and connect with your kid and create certain memories because at the end of the day, once they grow up, I don't think they remember what they wore or what they ate for Christmas, but they remember those memories. <laughs> so this is the time to really connect with them because I, as when they grow up, they leave. And then we're like, how are you? <laughs> Can you come spend time with me? I'm busy, mommy. <laughs> It's it's funny to listen to this too, because you made me go back to a memory I had of my kids when they were really little. We used to walk around this pond and we'd look at all the flowers and like at the time it felt like it took us forever to walk this quarter mile, like literally an hour and a half to walk it. As they've gotten older, a lot of the observations I made then are still true now. They've just developed and changed, obviously. Right. It's, it was time that you don't realize what an impression it makes on you but also the opportunity for them to explore and just to see what they love. And that's wow. huge. And they're tired and take naps really well after that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and they, want to be, they want to have that connection with you. And it's so busy. You get up, you go to work, you pick them up, you come back and you're rushing, you want to make dinner and stuff. It's so easy to go through your entire parenting journey without really sitting or sitting long enough to see your kid or even have that connection with them. And, and I see that a lot too, where it's just, but I provide for them. I give them what they need. I give them, they have a house, they have something to wear. They have all of this. I don't know what they want from me. They want you. <laughs> we miss out on that emotional aspect of well-being where we think, oh, it's just a physical and then that's it. But there's an emotional part of it that is extremely important too. So that's where play comes in. You can put everything together. We're playing together. We're dancing together. We're singing or we're creating something together. And it could be 10 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day. So it doesn't have to be like a, an extended period of time. But if my kid or if your kid knows that I am important enough where even though mommy is busy, she can shut down the computer and her phone and spend 30 minutes with me. It's just, oh, I get that connection. And next day I get the connection. The next day I get the connection. This kid is secure enough to know that I have a mother who is consistent and connects with me. So when I tell uh, my kid, give me two minutes, I'm busy. I'll be with you in 30 minutes. Guess what? The kid is gonna trust that you will be there in 30 minutes. And they'll sit there and wait for you. Yeah, that's, well, and I'm thinking too, some of the insecurities that we have as parents sometimes are maybe because we feel like there is that missing back to your connection piece. You yeah. feel in your heart that you're not connected in the way that you really are meant to be or really want to be. So you know that you're missing something, but maybe you can't identify it. Maybe that's part of it. And it's, 
Uh, it comes in different degrees, either based on how we, we're, we, our parents treated us or mm -hmm. the kind of household we grew up in or our ideas of parenting or the environment where we are, the friends or the people we're talking to. We end up doing the same things and experiencing the same things because we're confirming to each other that this is what's going on and stuff. If we're all thinking, oh, my parent did this, I would never do it and stuff, you end up going out really guarded, right? I'm not, I'm going at it from a different point where I'm not going to let my kids go through this, but you're forgetting why. <laughs> yeah, that may be because of what you experience and this kid has nothing to do with it. So it's first really, it starts with us, the parent. If mm -hmm. I can find a way to connect with myself, if I can find a way to be vulnerable, if I can find a way to know and be secure in who I am, then it's easy. Because then when I'm parenting my kid, it's not about me, I'm the boss or the head of this household and you're right here. No, we're right here. And it's okay. <laughs> I can be vulnerable with you. I'm sorry, baby, I didn't know that. Mommy has, I have no idea how to fix that problem right now. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. But then that's back to that relatability and that openness and that emotional that you're showing that you're human to them again. So yeah, that makes all the sense in the world being vulnerable. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about sleep, stress, how those contribute to wellness and health of the family. I know they both do. <laughs> yeah. oh, sleep. Oh, sleep is, huh. I dare to say is, more important than most of the other aspects because sleep is a time where your body rests sleep is the time when it heals itself and it really helps especially when you're stressed out i used this example in one of my videos where i said it's just like when you go to the grocery store or to any store right even a clothing store and stuff the shutdown and when they close the, do the doors, the, the whoever is there, the attendants go in there and put everything in place and organize it so that when you're coming in the next morning, it's easy. You can figure out where anything is. You can pick up what you need. If you need a size six or a size this, I need this. It's exactly where it needs to be. But if that, short, if that store stayed open 24, 48 hours and there's no one to go in there, there's no downtime to go in there and reorganize, everything will be out of place, right? Everything is scattered and you can't find anything. So imagine that you have no sleep, your, your, your thoughts are not organized, you're already in a place of overwhelm, you can't make decisions that are right, we end up taking two hours to make one decision that you would have probably done it in five minutes if you were rested. So when we're already overwhelmed and then there's stress and then there are things I have to do and it's just, it, the list goes on. And then if there's any kind of infection, guess what? Your body's already in a place of high inflammation that you end up getting even sicker, stress, you have headaches, you have tummy ache and all of that stuff that goes again. It's like a vicious cycle. And when I'm counseling a lot of uh, either parents or kids, I usually, if they're not getting enough sleep or we don't, or I was like, oh, I don't have time for sleep. I will deal with the sleep before I deal with the nutrition. <laughs> yeah. Because if I'm only getting four hours of sleep, the sleep affects what you eat. Because if I'm getting four hours of sleep, then I'm probably... Um, uh, surviving on caffeine <laughs> and you're craving more you tend to eat all the high sugar stuff because your body is craving something for energy so I may have a big muffin because I need that sugar rush I need that energy to get going and then by the time I get to the end of the day I've had yes I've survived but on a lot of caffeine a lot of sugar and a lot of things that I'm not necessarily working for me. And then I've spent, I've, I don't have time to spend with my kids because it just takes me that much time to organize my thoughts and my activities throughout the day. So and you're not going to sleep either because you had all that caffeine again. Correct. And then I get to bed and I'm laying there. I'm like, I'm so wired up and my mind is racing. I'm thinking about all the things I didn't do the day before <laughs> or what I've done or the mess I made. And then I'm cleaning up. So it's this vicious cycle 
So sleep is really, it's really important in so many ways. So when it comes to sleep routines, I usually talk again, back to routines, right? Where <laughs> if caffeine is a problem, because a lot of people don't realize it, because when you take caffeine after a certain time of the day, it will affect your sleep. So if you're someone who uh, is having a hard time falling asleep, start out with your dinner. What do you eat for dinner? What are you drinking throughout the day? There was another patient I had where my kid does not sleep, but what they were drinking for dinner is iced tea. I'm in Georgia. I'm like, oh, <laughs> iced tea here. And the tea had caffeine in it. And no wonder the kid cannot sleep. So really going back to start assessing, what am I having for dinner? There's certain things that are better digested when you're going to sleep. If you're having a heavy meal, like an hour before going to sleep, your body may be working on digestion and just interferes with your sleep. So you may have to push your eating time a little bit earlier if you have that luxury or that ability to do it or just change it out where you're having your lightest meal at nighttime with some kind of protein or fiber and stuff so the fiber and the protein are heavy enough to carry you through the night but not too much of the carbs and stuff in there so switching things around instead of drinking juice and stuff just drink water before you go to sleep mm -hmm. um sometimes even wine. I have this habit where I'm like, I get back home, it's a long day, I have a glass of wine, I sit in front of the couch, I take that light tiny nap, and then I finally wake up and I get to bed and I can't go to sleep. All of that is interrupting your sleep too. So it's just really having some kind of a routine that is relaxing, right? Starting with dinner time and after dinner time, maybe homework for kids, depending if you have kids who need homework or you can even get your kids, I say get your kids, your kids are there to support you. We do it together because I have to do all of this. I'm like, no, we're going to eat together. We're cleaning up this table together. We're washing together. We're doing this because again, I can't do it for you all the time because when you grow up, you're not going to do it for yourself and expecting someone else to do it for you. I have to teach you how to do it. Yes, it's going to be messy. Yes, sometimes it's easier if I just do it. But then again, that's another connection time. And believe it or not, when you stop or slow down to teach the kid or connect with them, it's relaxing too. Mm -hmm. It helps where it's just, it puts, it pauses on everything you need to do but you're giving and it's relaxing. And whether you want to try other relaxation activities, maybe yoga or, or just different things that are going to help you relax mm -hmm. at nighttime before going to sleep. The bedroom environment is important too. Yeah. If you have TVs or electronics, of course, that light interferes with your sleep cycle and stuff, right? So you want to shut it down at least an hour before bedtime. If if the room is not dark enough, that could interfere, especially if you maybe want to put dark night shades or put one of those night shades over your eyes to go to sleep. So it just depends. If the temperature is too hot, I see that a lot where like kids will go to sleep and they keep waking up in the middle of the night, especially with babies who try to bundle them up. <laughs> excuse me because we're like oh my baby's too cold and the poor kids have like heat rashes on their head and around their necks and they can't sleep at night I'm like it's too hot <laughs> so that would interfere, interfere with the sleep too yeah it's interesting you brought that up because one of the questions I had was how can you help maybe it's your kid maybe it's you but decompress quick so that you can sleep because sometimes that anxiety in your mind or just in your body is so big that you lay down and it seems like it just, it's like blowing off your body. It's magnifying because you're trying to sleep, right? Yeah. Journaling. If, if, if it's the anxiety, I usually say just journal down those thoughts, right? Because they're in there and your body, your mind is trying to figure it out or put it together and stuff. So maybe that may be something that you add on to your sleep schedule where maybe after you get your kids to bed and stuff, you can just journal. And journaling, talking to uh, parents or even kids over time, if that's your first time, it may be like, I don't know what to write. You don't have to be all elaborate. It doesn't have to be perfect. It could just be a list. You could just, okay, this thought popped in my mind. I'm just going to write it down. I don't have to have, make it a complete sentence because then it's another stress. I'm, oh my gosh, I don't know what to write. What am I going to do about this? So, so you can just, it could be a list of things. As it comes to your mind, I just write it down. Oh, I didn't do that. Okay, I'll write it down and just write down what comes in. Another thing is that I like to do is I like reflective thinking at the end of the day where I kind of let my day run by gratitude. 
yeah, what are three things I'm grateful for today? And how did my day go? What did I really do right? What was what did I want to do that I didn't do? And I'll put it down. I can do it tomorrow. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> I don't think there, there are days that there's so many days where I'm like ah I didn't finish everything I needed to do today but it's okay I'll just make sure I do it tomorrow I'll put it on the list for the next day and stuff or oh, what happened that I didn't do it did I and was I distracted somewhere did I end up scrolling on Facebook <laughs> or doing something else and no judgment there okay? because sometimes I could go on Facebook to post something and then before I know it it's been an hour <laughs> you've been of you scrolling okay how did I get there so it's just figuring out again every day is learning it's like when you pay attention to okay what am I grateful for how did my day go why didn't I do what I said I was going to do? What were the distractions? How can I switch my schedule around so that it doesn't go that way anymore? That's awesome. It sounds simple when you talk about it. <laughs> and and that's the whole aim because there there's a lot of information. There's a lot of things you can do. There are all these things you can do. But once it's simple, it makes it real. I can do it. That's the whole idea. I'm like, you can do it. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> You have a group that you've started called Generational Wellbeing. Yes. So Generational Wellbeing. So that's uh, what I'm working on right now. So all the information and the content, I'm putting it under Generational Wellbeing. And mainly because, again, we have to take care of certain things, whether it's the behaviors, whether it's the habits and stuff that maybe we have certain things that we've done to lead us to where we are and maybe the same things that our parents did to get them to where they are. If we don't start taking or making the changes now, our kids are going to end up with those same diagnoses, with those same behaviors, with those same things that may not be serving us. So that's why I like the generational because I'm talking to mothers, but really paying attention that, ah, my dad had diabetes, high blood pressure and stuff. I don't want it. I want to be the person who stops it from that's, that's not what we have anymore. I want to change it where, no, we're healthy. We eat healthy in our family. That's what we do, right? <laughs> yeah. So changing that culture. Love, I love that because it gives us as parents the ability to make the change, to, to make the choice to make the change. Correct. Correct. Yes. And, and really starting from where you are too, really understanding that we're all starting from different points, but the whole goal is to create a place where, a safe place where you can be vulnerable enough to say, this is where I am. I need help. And, and we provide help. We provide feedback. We help you or I help you starting from where you are and give you just personalized directions, simple, practical step at a time it's not the quick fixes if so it's usually i usually say if you're not ready it's not yeah you have to be ready to be consistent to do it so if someone was listening to this podcast and they were motivated to make a change in their family do you have maybe three easy steps that they can do as soon as they get off the podcast yes so three easy steps i would say start by i will say start by looking at where you are if you want to make a change, what change, what do you expect? What do you want for your health? What do you want for your family? What do you want for your relationship? So start with that why, because once I know what I want and why I want it, then I'm able to say, okay, this is what I really want. What can I do to get to where I want? Then you can now make certain changes knowing that there's something I'm working towards knowing why I am doing it. Because if you don't know why you're doing something, chances are like you're going to quit halfway. If if I'm going to the gym just because I want to lose 10 pounds, what happens after you lose 10 pounds? Okay, what options are there? I want to sleep. I've been sleeping two hours a night. I've had issues falling asleep and stuff. If that's what you want to do, why do you want it? How is the sleep affecting you right now? I'm exhausted. I'm reactive. It's just not working out. My relationship with my kids. I don't have a relationship with my kids. My kids are acting off. My life is 
chaotic and stuff. I just want some kind of stability. And I think the sleep may be the thing affecting it. Okay, I guess sleep is what we're going to work on. Because I like to work on one, two, maximum three things at a time. Because when you start taking on too much, it can be overwhelming now on the other side, right? <laughs> Every day, celebrate the wins. That's the second thing. So if I decide I'm going to start it, understanding that it takes time, but I have to celebrate. Oh, I did it. We had lunch. We had dinner at 6 p.m. today. We all sat down. It, didn't, it was awkward, but we did it. That's a good win, right? Yeah. yeah. And it could also be, I'm going to have to change the, the temperature in my room. I may have to block something. And I want to say one other thing. I know I'm going all over the place. One more thing, right? The sleep part of it, the, the mistake people will make is that if every night I have been sleeping at 2, 2 a.m., I don't expect to fall asleep. I would say, oh, I'm going to change everything. I'm going to turn everything down and then go to sleep at 9 p.m. Your brain is still wired. It's going to take you a while, Right. It may be, okay, I'm used to going to bed at 2 a.m. I may go at 1.30 the first night and then 1 o'clock, like gradual changes to the point where you get to that target. So small changes, just pick one thing and be consistent with it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because I think that is something somebody would try. Because <laughs> you're like, okay, I, wanted, I think sleep is really important. I've been getting two hours of sleep, four hours of sleep. I'm going to shut everything down. We have dinner. Everybody go to bed. Let's <laughs> go to sleep. Yeah, and then not... you'll just lay there awake and hungry. Yes, I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm hungry. And then before you know, it's like it's not working. And then you get back to where you were. So just being realistic is, is, is another thing. You have to be realistic with the changes, knowing that it's small, it's gradual. If it's the time, you, so we have dinner, we have some kind of relaxing activity together. With exercise though, you want to make sure it's a relaxing exercise activity, nothing too intensive, because if it's intensive, that will really interfere with your sleep. You maybe have dinner, walk around the neighborhood with your kids or your family and stuff, take it nice and slow because that walking or outside air is very refreshing, it's relaxing. So anything that will help you get you away from that sympathetic state, that fight or flight, that active into a parasympathetic state, that nice rest and relax, that will help your sleep too. Those are great suggestions and, and things people can do. They're functional things you can do and you get more time with your family on top of that. As you start doing that, it becomes second nature because we're creatures of habit too. You're not thinking about it. It reduces the number of decisions you have to make each day. I don't have to wake up in the morning and think, huh, how am I going to get my hair done today? Hmm. Oh, what am I going to wear tomorrow and stuff? You start planning where, okay, this is what I wear for. I, I do it. Like I have this hairstyle because I, I don't have to do anything. The, that's not a decision I get to make each day. It is done, right? You start making certain decisions. Like what else can I do today? If you already have everything, there's so many decisions you don't have to make. Everybody in the household knows you wake up in the morning, you make up. I'm not telling you to do it because it's already routine. We all know where we're going. <laughs> we all know what time we're going. If there's a change in it, we're communicating to each other. And the kids love routine too, whether we know it or not. Most kids, actually all kids love routine because again, it communicates to them that security. Awesome. That's awesome. I know that people are going to want to reach out to you and get more information. And they're probably going to want to know a little bit more about your program. So where can they go to find you the easiest? I am on Facebook and Instagram. It's at drlomd.com. Oh, I also have a, um, a Facebook group, Generational Wellbeing. You can DM me or you can send me an email at loom at drlomd.com. And it's easier that way because once I put out the program information, all everything is going to be on there. And also the YouTube at drlumkrundi.com. Yeah, YouTube at drlumkrundi.com. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Dr. Lim, thank you so much for your time today. This was awesome. We had so many great pieces of wisdom and you're just great to talk to. Thank you. Thank you. It was amazing. I loved every bit of it. <laughs>